Good afternoon and welcome back to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, March 31st, and we are uh, continuing our consideration and testimony of S3, an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Um, and we don't have too much time today, but I do appreciate our witnesses being here today and your flexibility, and we'll, we'll see how we can do um, by four o'clock or shortly before. So um, AJ Rubin of the um, Disability Rights Vermont. There you are. Um, good afternoon, welcome, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today. Uh, my name is AJ Rubin, I'm the supervising attorney at Disability Rights Vermont. Um, excuse the phone. Um, we are the state's mental health care ombudsman. Um, as well as the federally authorized protection and advocacy system for Vermont. I don't know how to shut off my phone, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, the, uh, our office um, has a pretty unique position uh, regarding the subject matter of S3. Um, we uh, represent uh, people with mental health conditions, serious mental illness around the state uh, especially in institutions like hospitals and prisons and in the community. And we also uh, have a pretty large practice representing victims of crime with disabilities. Uh, our office uh, formally represents um, victims of crime in every county in the state. And through our advocacy efforts, we assist many, many more every year to deal with the, the tragic uh, fallout of, of being victimized. And so uh, our testimony is informed by both working with people with mental health conditions who are victims and working with people with mental health conditions who have, who have committed crimes or have victimized people and been found not guilty by reason of insanity or not competent to stand trial. Uh, my most important message for the committee today is that uh, Vermont has needed improvements in the representation of criminal defendants uh, found to be not competent or not guilty for many years, uh, and uh, aspects of S3 uh, will effectively resolve that, that lack of appropriate representation by having the Mental Health Law Project become involved. So that seems like it is uh, destined to make a good positive impact. In addition, the, uh, the effort to have task force and advisory committees look at the forensic capacity in the state uh, has, has also been something that our office and many advocates for people with disabilities for years have been requesting. And so that also should have a very positive impact on the needs of our community. Um, so overall, there are many parts of S3 that we uh, think uh, fit the, the needs of our state uh, and uh, they're very right-minded. The only controversial aspect of the, of the bill from uh, our point of view is the aspect of um, the section regarding notification of, of uh, orders of non-hospitalization status. To be clear, um, uh, I listened to the testimony this morning. It was extremely compelling. Um, uh, both um, uh, um, Mrs. Cortendick and uh, Mrs. Carroll uh, were um, extremely gracious uh, and, and, and persuasive. Um, and I agree with, with almost everything they said. Um, Specifically, Vermont, you know, should be first in many things. And, and um, as uh, Mrs. Carroll said, um, I had testified in the Senate that um, as far as I could tell, there was no other state that had a provision like this provision that would require notification about the status of someone's order of non-hospitalization, whether the treatment plan is adequate and whether they're complying. Um, but what I want to reiterate is that uh, DRVT does think that Vermont should be a leader. In, in an effective response to people's needs for community mental health support and systems. Uh, unfortunately, this aspect of the bill uh, will likely create a lot of legal problems and will have no positive impact on what really needs to happen. Um, you know, both Mrs. Cortendick and uh, Mrs. Carroll said that we have a right to safety in our society, and, and DRBT firmly believes that. Um, they also testify that the Department of Mental Health doesn't seem to have the capacity to effectively monitor, supervise, and protect the public from people who are placed in its custody under, under orders of non-hospitalization. I, I think that's also probably true. 
Our concern with the language in the bill right now is that it's um, unworkable, uh, very vague, and, and fraught with, with uh, legal challenge opportunities. Um, the reason why it's just not very um, functional is that the terms are not defined in terms of what is compliance with the treatment plan, when is it adequate, when would the commissioner get notified, uh, what would the commissioner do with that information. Um, I've, I've spoken with um, uh, James Pepper and David Schur, as well as Sarah Robinson from the network, um, and I think we all agree uh, that uh, some more work on that section should occur. We're happy to do that work. Um, you know, at the end of the day, Vermonters have a right to know that if someone commits a violent act and they're placed into the, com the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health, that the Commissioner and the Agency of Human Services uh, together will, will protect the society from that person uh, and make that person have a quality of life that doesn't require they be locked up for the whole you know, for their existence as well. So if that's possible. So there are a lot of opportunities to enhance the community mental health system, to make sure that victims of people have information they need so they can feel safe and secure. Uh, but the aspects uh, that are currently in the bill seem, seem quite problematic. And so we would ask that, you know, I think uh, it would be a good idea to avoid litigation and to have a more effective bill to frankly delete that section uh, and then uh, have the study committee come up with the details of how to implement it. Because as I said earlier, currently the, the details are vague. I, it doesn't seem like it's very functional um, and it could, uh, there could be a opportunity to really make some improvements there if the, if the summer study committee or the, the committee could, could look at those things. In um, terms of- I'm sorry, excuse me, AJ. Um, can you just, um, I, I think I know where you're, what section you're referring to, but if you could, um, I think you're on page six. Um, yes, I'm, I'm on page, um, page six of 11. This is section C, uh, when a person is committed under section to non-hospitalization and there's little I is the person is not complying with the order and uh, two little I is the alternative treatment has not been adequate. Those are the sections I'm referring to, yes, uh, Representative, and they are the ones that seem most problematic. Again, there, there is a, a uh, we do not object, and we don't think, we don't think there's any uh, legal problem with notifying uh, victims when a person is um, in violation of their o ONH and a motion to revoke the ONH has been filed, when they move from a, a secure facility to a community setting, other states have those kinds of, uh, of um, notices and they have not been subject to challenge. Um, and again, Vermont should be a leader in supporting victims and we should be a leader in having a robust community mental health system and we should be doing those things. This notice provision doesn't really do either of those things and, and um, is sort of a false, a false sense of security. What really needs to happen is we have to fully fund our community mental health system as well as our victims advocacy system. Uh, I, I understand that one of the bright spots in, in people's um, course through the, through the criminal justice system when you're a victim is the victims advocates. They, they are such compassionate people. Uh, but as, um, as uh, Mrs. Carroll said, I think, um, they have limited information and they have actually limited time. My office spends a lot of time working with victims with disabilities because we have expertise in that and it takes more time and the state's attorneys, victims, advocates often don't have that time. So there are ways to monitor people who are known to be possibly violent without locking them up. And there are ways to support victims of crime without notifying them about things they have no control over and would just cause anxiety. Like, you know, maybe the person didn't go to two of their meetings. Is that non-compliance with a treatment plan? Does the victim need to know that? What would, that, what would they do with it? Um, one of the concerns I have with the way the bill is currently written is notice of non-compliance with a treatment plan would go to a state's attorney, but the state's attorney may be required or may choose to give that to the victim. The victim could then put that on Facebook um, and that would have a pretty negative impact on the person's treatment uh, who's under care. And in the long run, that would be bad for everyone. So I think there's a lot of room to improve the system. That section of the bill seems very problematic and sort of and you know good intended but not what we really need what will what will help save lives 
and prevent injury is having a much more robust community mental health system that has the capacity at, at lots of different levels to provide support. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, and I appreciate um, your um, willingness to, to meet with some of the uh, other stakeholders and, and work, on, work on language. So, um, so I would ask you to, um, to do that for the, for the next time that we, that we meet on this. Um, great, thank you. Go, keep going, go ahead. My, my only last two points is that it's pretty easy to, um, to alleviate the problems that the, that the parents were talking about in terms of the, the, when someone goes into the custody of, of mental health, uh, the victims don't know anything about anymore. And the easy way to resolve that is to give the, the person who caused the injury, the person now under custody, the opportunity to consent, to provide some information to the person they've harmed. I've represented a lot of people in that situation and by and large, they have remorse and, and they wanna make amends for something they did when they did not have control over themselves and therefore they're not criminally liable. So there are ways to, 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 to fix that problem through consent and notice um, that is really the, the easiest way to resolve those. So I'm happy to, I know we're limited on time. I really appreciate the effort of the committee. For the most part, this bill is, is uh, very much needed. We'll fix a lot of problems. This one small area would probably best be served by having more study uh, about how to actually fix the problems that are identified. Thank you for your time. Okay. And again, um... I don't. I don't mean to rush you. Um, but, you know, if you have more testimony, please, please go ahead, and we, we will be spending much more time on this. So, um, and certainly we'll have you back. But I don't want you to, to feel rushed. So, I feel like I've, I've uh, I, the okay. testimony was very strong this morning, and I think I've said my piece. I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm certainly uh, eager to work with the other stakeholders so that we get a bill that will address the needs and not cause undue confusion. Great. Thank you, thank you. Any uh, committee members, and that includes Representative Donahue, I'm not sure if Representative Marcy is here, but any, any questions? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so Jack McCullough, good afternoon. Yes, yeah. thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a while since I've been here and uh, there's a lot of new members here, so good to see people. Um, I'm, I'm Jack McCullough. I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid, and I'm the director of uh, the Mental Health Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid. And <clears throat> what we do is the Mental Health Law Project re represents people all across the state of Vermont in all civil proceedings relating to involuntary mental health care. That includes original requests to commit someone to a hospital, uh, requests for involuntary medication, requests to uh, extend orders of involuntary treatment, um, basically everything that, that could impose involuntary mental health treatment on somebody except for the hospitalization hearings in, in criminal cases, which is part of the subject of this, this bill. Um, I appreciate that the uh, legislature has been committed to moving this bill forward. This uh, bill, at least in part, arises out of uh, a working group on uh, called the Commission on Offenders with Mental Illness, established by the legislature in 2016. And it uh, incorporated representatives of all, all the players that have uh, some piece of this uh, issue, including uh, state's attorneys, the public defense system, the Department of Corrections, the P Department of Mental Health, the judiciary, um, pretty much everyone you can imagine, uh, uh, Mental Health Law Project, Disability Rights Vermont. And one of the outcomes of that case, of that project was 
a recommendation that uh, when a person, when a criminal defendant is found incompetent to stand trial and is faced with the next step in the process in which the criminal division is considering involuntarily committing that person to the hospital or to an order of non-hospitalization, the uh, person should be represented by someone from the, from the mental health law project rather than from the uh, public defender system or from uh, or by their retained counsel if uh, if they wish and the purpose the reason is quite clear just as i would hesitate to represent someone in a criminal charge because that's not in my expertise the uh, all the players in the system recognize that um, the resources and the issues involved in the involuntary mental health system are not within the expertise of the state's attorneys and the and the defense bar and that allowing us to represent people in these in these hearings gives them the opportunity to be re represented by the uh, by the attorneys with the greatest level of expertise in this area this is literally all we do and if I say so myself, we do it well. Um, so I should talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the process and the, and the concepts here. We heard a presentation this morning about the concept of being incompetent to stand trial and how that relates to uh, sanity or insanity. Um, the key concept for, of, being incompetent to stand trial is that the defendant does not have the ability to understand the proceedings or to assist his or her attorney in preparing a defense. And I can give you a couple of examples that might explain how that could come about. We occasionally represent people in our cases who don't even recognize that they're engaged in a court proceeding of any kind. We sometimes represent people who, because of their mental illness, are not able to um, trust the people who are appointed to represent them. We have um, people whose mental illness might lead them to conclude that no matter what they do, some unseen forces are going to direct the outcome of the court proceeding, and so there's no point to to working with their attorney to prepare a defense. And in those cases, we, in, in my cases, we sometimes request a guardian ad litem to be appointed to protect the party's interest. That also happens sometimes in, in criminal cases. Um, if the person is found incompetent to stand trial, or if the defendant is found not guilty by reason of insanity after trial, then the next step is a hospitalization hearing at which the court will determine whether the person suffers from a mental illness and whether the person requires commitment to the custody of the Department of Mental Health in order to protect either the person or other members of the public. Um, I've heard it said is in some of the discussion of this bill that the Department of Mental Health is not concerned with public safety as uh, as it works with the uh, with the people in its custody. In fact, I think that's a bit of an overstatement because in, in reality, the uh, the proceedings in the family division or the, the proceedings under Title Thirteen for commitment do apply the standard of, is the person a person in need of treatment or a patient in need of further treatment? And that means, does the person as a result of mental illness pose a danger to herself or others? And so one justification for the person being committed or being placed on an order of non-hospitalization is that involuntary treatment is necessary 
for the protection of the public. And those are the cases that we, those are the questions that we litigate in, in our proceedings. Um, let me see. In, in our cases, there are, and in a hospitalization hearing in the, in the criminal division, there are two possible outcomes, there are three possible outcomes, but the two custodial outcomes that uh, we have in mind are the person could be ordered hospitalized or the person could be placed by order of the court on an order of non-hospitalization, which is an order committing the person to the custody of the Department of Mental Health and requiring them to follow certain conditions. And in either case, the, the justification is that involuntary treatment is necessary for public safety. And those are the questions we, we address. Once the person is on an order of non-hospitalization, they receive treatment from generally from one of the community mental health centers. And they, the orders typically include provisions like go to all your appointments, take your prescribed medications, uh, don't do anything that poses a threat or danger to yourself or others. Sometimes they can include provisions regarding uh, the use of alcohol or controlled substances. Sometimes they include provisions about uh, the person's residence, all directed towards what is, uh, what is established in court to, to be needed to keep the person safe, to keep the person from posing a threat to themselves or others. And in those cases, we have a right to, and the ability to challenge all of the uh, predicate facts to support the, uh, support the commitment. So if the person, if, if there's an argument that the person is not a danger, then that's, that's an argument that we, we raise. Um, if, the, uh, if the person is not complying with the order of non-hospitalization, then what generally happens is that the agency is in communication with the Department of Mental Health and the department can file a request with the court to enforce the order by revoking it and ordering the person returned to the hospital. And what could happen is the court could, uh, could order some modification of the order. And I've had that happen. The court could find that the, person, the state has not demonstrated that the hospitalization is necessary or the court could determine that the person needs to be hospitalized, they're violating the order, it's, they're not showing that, the, uh, that they're safe to be, uh, to be in public, and as a consequence, they might be returned to a hospital. Um, and we're already representing people on those cases, and we litigate those cases uh, regularly. Um, just have a couple of other things. And one is with regard to uh, A.J. Rubin's uh, comments. I, I agree that there's a real issue about the notification process. And, uh, and there are two somewhat contradictory uh, provisions of the, of the bill, the way it's now written. On, uh, on page, on section three of the bill, um, in page, on page six, there's a provision for requ that requires the uh, commissioner of the Department of Mental Health to notify the state's attorney if the person is not complying with the order or treatment is not adequate to meet the person's needs. Then on uh, page uh, page ten of the Ten of the bill, the which is section four, the study, or section uh, six, the uh, working care working group. The bill pre prescribes that the uh, working group will 
evaluate the same these same issues of, of notification. I do think that uh, having these uh, notification issues being uh, discussed at, at the working group um, for recommendations on where we should how we should go with this is, is the way to go. Um, I think there might only be one other small thing that I should mention. Um, in section three of the bill, and this is really just a wording issue. In second, section three of the bill, uh, page six, uh, line one, uh, includes the word absconds. Any the per any time the person absconds from the custody of the commissioner, you know, abscond is not a term that's uh, defined in in our statute, and it's not a uh, part of the general terminology of the mental health system. Um, in a situation like this, the term we would typically use is, is elope, which is already uh, defined at 18 VSA section 7101 subsection five. And I'd suggest that it makes sense to change, uh, replace absconds with elopes. Um, I think that's, all I have at the moment, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Great, thank you. Appreciate your your testimony. Um, Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. I'm gonna lower my hand quick so I don't forget. <laughs> so Jack, nice to see you. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I'm wondering about a couple of things. One is, um, what is the commissioner of mental health's sort of liability for making a mistake? Like if somebody isn't safe and is in the community, I mean, is there, is that considered um, negligence or uh, is, is there something on the hook, like I know state attorneys feel very sensitive because I guess, because they're elected and don't want to make our communities unsafe. So how does that work with the commissioner? Representative, I think there's an answer to that question. Um, I don't really want to tell you what the answer is because I'm not sure what the answer is. I noticed that uh, Karen Barber, the general counsel of the department is here and I think she'd probably be a better person to answer that. Thank you. So here's my second question. This morning we heard some cases where it sure seemed like uh, the way the laws are written now, they're skewed in one way. Um, have you worked with clients where it felt like it was sort of the exact opposite situation? Because if so, I'd be curious to hear more about those cases so we can make sure we're threading the needle. Um, yeah, I hate, I hate to say what happened in those previous cases. Obviously, we heard about a couple of terrible tragedies that, uh, that really should we should do everything we can to make sure those uh, those don't get repeated. I think right. one of the concerns that we've, uh, that most mental health advocates have had has been, as uh, AJ said, a lack of uh, adequate capacity in the mental health system so that even people who are wanting help can't always get the help they, they're looking for and they need and that, may cause them to have their condition get worse and worse and not be and not uh, not be able to be be safe but but we do see cases where um, we think that the uh, agency is probably seeking to have someone committed see, keeping people in cu custody for a longer time than is really necessary and uh, and that's part of what, what we're trying to do in, in the cases that we uh, that we litigate. So we're we challenge whether the evidence is really there for um, 
keeping a person in state custody. I can tell you about five years ago, I litigated a case in the Vermont Supreme Court called In Re TSS. And uh, <clears throat> I don't wanna go too much into the details, but uh, this is a young guy who had been in the mental health system for many years, but there was no evidence that he had ever really done anything dangerous. There were, they were pretty sure that he was not in very good shape and he, uh, he needed help, but no sign that he'd done anything dangerous. The statute says that uh, the state has to prove that the person is a patient in need of further treatment, someone who's receiving adequate treatment and who would be likely to become a person in need of treatment in the near future if treatment were discontinued. The question in that case was, does that mean that all the state needs to prove is he's likely to de deteriorate in the new, near future and then become a danger at some time after that? Or do they need to show that he was going to be have his condition deteriorate and become dangerous both in the near future? And the, uh, the Supreme Court determined that they needed to show that he would become a danger in the near future in order to justify keeping him in custody. And so we won that case and we've won a number of similar cases where the uh, mental health system is pretty confident that the person is mentally ill, but they really can't establish that at some time in the near future, the uh, person would be dangerous without treatment whether or not they've been dangerous in the past. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that we have to have to stop and, um, and not hear from everybody, but a number of us have, have meetings. Thank you, so, I'll be here whenever you want me. Okay, well, thank you. We, um, I know Evan has been reaching out to, um, to many, if not all of you, um, about Friday, uh, Friday after the floor, and then uh, and then we'll start up again at Friday, you know, one fifteen. If that doesn't work for your schedules, certainly, um, you know, we have next week. We'll be coming back to this bill. This is this is a bill that uh, takes time, and I want to make sure we we hear from everybody. So, with that, uh, we will adjourn. Thank you.